Chris Rogers. I'm a physiatrist, a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician. I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Mary Ambach. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm glad to be here. And uh, so Dr. Ambach will be presenting some information in the second half of this uh, program. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, which is a non-surgical sports medicine specialty. I've been in practice in San Diego uh, for more than 20 years. I'm actually San Diego native, so I'm very blessed to continue to practice in this great city. Um, and uh, I, I have uh, some special training in um, interventional pain management, as well as some advanced training, training in, in use of, use of uh, uh, imaging, imaging studies. studies. And we'll talk, we'll more, talk about more about that, that in a bit. In a bit. Dr. Ambach is also is trained also in physical in medicine and rehabilitation. Oh, if somebody could mute in one second. Thank you. So Dr. Ambach is also trained in physical medicine and rehabilitation and, and also fellowship trained in uh, spine and musculoskeletal and interventional pain management, as well as regenerative medicine. There are very few doctors in the country who are actually board cert or fellowship trained in regenerative medicine. Regenerative medicine is a very new field uh, It's the concept of using your own cells to regenerate tissues. And, and um, Dr. Ambrock brings a lot of experience uh, to our clinic. Um, and so here's a summary of what we will be covering today. We're going to talk over talk about some common causes of joint pain, osteoarthritis being the most common. We're going to talk about how we are treating our patients uh, in this new environment with the impact of uh, the pandemic uh, influencing how patients access medical care. And then we're going to also go over some of the newer treatments that are available uh, for treatment of osteoarthritis. At the very end, we'd like to take your questions. And as Amanda mentioned, there's a a chat function. So if you mouse over the screen, you'll see a bar that appears, a little uh, bubble, um, the third bubble from the right, a little, um, uh, if you click on that, you'll see a place where you can enter your message. So we'll, we'll take those questions. This is our office here in Carlsbad. Some of you have been to our office. Uh, we built this uh, about three and a half years ago now. We're very, very fortunate. This is very close to the flower fields in Carlsbad. Um, we had to build this space because um, our old space would not accommodate the, the um, services that we wanted to accommodate. So we have very nice um, space here. It's very open and airy, which we like. We have a lot of windows, which is um, we're very fortunate because with this pandemic, of course, we don't want to be in closed spaces and we want to get a lot of exposure to sunlight. This is our procedure suite. Um, it has, uh, you see there, um, some imaging equipment on the right. That big machine is a, is a digital x-ray machine that we use for imaging uh, joints and bones. And then on the left, you see an ultrasound machine, which we use for imaging soft tissues, such as tendons and ligaments. This is our lab where we process uh, tissues, different types of tissues, uh, blood, bone marrow, and fat are the, are the most typical that you would uh, that we would typically use. Um, and so we have this state of the art lab uh, where we can um, perform FDA compliant treatments. Our office is a maximum uh, safety zone. Uh, we screen patients on the phone um, beforehand, uh, make sure that they're low risk. Um, our, our staff is tested regularly with antibody testing. Anybody who comes in the office is, has a temperature check and um, patients who undergo procedures have their antibodies tested as well. We uh, disinfect the office uh, in between patients. We have, um, we're probably about 50% capacity. So in any given day, we're, we're very low um, traffic. And then we also use ultraviolet light, which has been shown to be helpful for disinfecting the room, uh, which is why sunlight is effective for keeping uh, virus loads to uh, very low. Uh, I met Dr. Ambach uh, while we were um, at a medical conference about four or five years ago. Both Dr. Ambach and I like to talk, we like to educate, and we uh, lecture at several meetings around the country and around the world uh, to our colleagues. Um, we actually were just involved in a conference uh, last weekend, 800 physicians from around the world, talking about the use of uh, cells and cell-based therapy uh, for treatment of osteoarthritis. We've uh, contributed to the textbooks. Uh, we've written a variety of book chapters and we've conducted clinical research. So we feel we're qualified to speak about this. 
Um, this is important. This is probably the first point uh, that we'd like to make, and that is when anybody who presents with joint pain should be evaluated by somebody who has expertise in this area. So typically this would be a board certified orthopedic surgeon or physical medicine doctor, such as Dr. Ambach and myself, or perhaps a sports medicine physician, because there are many different reasons for joint pain. Not all knees are created equal. So for example, osteoarthritis is the most common type of joint pain, but there are many different kinds of problems a patient may have damage to their cartilage, but they may also have damage to their meniscus or to their ligaments. Uh, there, there, there can be a variety of issues that need to be addressed to customize the care to that patient. Um, there are other causes of joint pain. So if you're familiar with rheumatoid arthritis where the immune system would attack the cartilage and lead to a disease of cartilage. Uh, gout is a condition where you have too much uric acid in the blood. So it's important to first get the diagnosis right. I think this is what we do probably better than most clinics is we get the diagnosis right, both the tissue diagnosis as well as the biomechanic diagnosis so that our treatment plans are more customized and, our, and that's why our success rates are higher. If you look at the anatomy of a joint, uh, you see two bones coming together. This would be a finger joint. So if you look at your finger, you see two bones come together. At the end of the bone, there's articular cartilage which can become damaged and typically does by age 50 in one or more joints in the body. Surrounding the joint is a joint capsule, the articular capsule, which contains the fluid. The fluid is synovial fluid, which lubricates the cartilage and nourishes the cartilage. So arthritis can involve any or all of these tissues, including the bone. If the cartilage is damaged significantly, there can be damage to the underlying bone. And that's critical because that bone does provide some nourishment to the cartilage as well. Osteoarthritis is typically thought of as a wear and tear scenario that also may involve the meniscus, which are these C-shaped uh, structures in the joint, but um, it's, it's actually a very complicated disease. Osteoarthritis is a chronic inflammation of the joint uh, and the biology as well as the genetics of this disease have been very well characterized. Outside of the joint, you have soft tissues such as tendons and ligaments, which support the joint. And then you have these little bursa, which are fluid filled sacs, which cushion the, the tendons and ligaments so that they don't uh, become damaged as they roll over the surface of the bone. Any one of these tissues can be a source of pain if they become damaged. So when we talk about the management of arthritis, you know, arthritis has been around since the beginning of time. If you look at the CAT scan of a mummy from ancient Egypt, you'll see that those poor people suffered from osteoarthritis as well with damage on their x-rays and CAT scans. Um, so uh, they probably did not have access to ice, but everybody here has access to ice. And that's a great way to manage pain as it decreases swelling and decreases the pain associated with inflammation of the joint. Heating pads can be helpful for relaxing the muscles or the soft tissues, getting blood flow to tissues that maybe have been damaged. Using um, a, a knee brace uh, can be helpful if you're active, if you like to go out and play pickleball or go for a walk. It's helpful to have a little extra support uh, so that you don't stress the ligaments in the joint. And these are all things that can be done at home as well as exercises. And um, most of the time we have patients working with physical therapists. So it's important that the alignment, for example, of the kneecap, the way the kneecap moves in the leg or the way the muscles function in the leg, this is important for supporting the joint. Um, but uh, with, with COVID, it's been a little bit more challenging, although a lot of physical therapists are doing telehealth, so you can uh, do your exercises at home if you prefer to do that. Some therapists are now beginning to see patients in the office. If you're fortunate enough to have access to a pool that's heated, um, that's a great way to exercise without loading the joints too severely. But there are just countless scientific studies that show that exercise is probably the most effective way to manage uh, moderate, mild to moderate pain, and even in some cases, severe, severe uh, arthritis can be managed with exercise. Uh, so we talked about telemedicine. We all, um, walking is kind of counterintuitive. There are actually a number of studies that show that walking, uh, if it's well tolerated, can be therapeutic, and the compression of the cartilage is actually helpful in nourishing the cartilage. And so um, in the beginning, we used to tell runners that running was bad for your cartilage, but further studies have shown that the opposite is true. Runners are actually protected. So if you've been a runner most of your life, your cartilage is probably a little bit healthier than the rest of us. 
Uh, then you get into the different medications that have been used over the years. The most common are the anti-inflammatory medications. So things like Advil or Motrin or Aleve, Naproxen, these are medications. We have to take into consideration that some patients may have contraindications for these medications. You may have a stomach ulcer, you may have high blood pressure, something that would preclude you from using these medicines. There's all kinds of topical analgesics that you can purchase over the counter at the drugstore. Some people find these to be very helpful. Lately, people have been using CBD oil. There seems to be some evidence that that's helpful, uh, whether it's a topical uh, lotion or uh, oral um, oil, uh, you know, drops of oil. We try to stay away from narcotics, opioid analgesics, although in some cases that, that may be necessary for temporary relief of pain. Since the 1940s, a steroid has been um, used to decrease the inflammation, uh, but the, the main issue with the steroids is that they tend to be short uh, uh, in duration in terms of their uh, uh, effectiveness. Some of you may have had cortisone injections in a joint and have had very good relief. It's very rare that a patient would get more than three or four months relief. Occasionally, we do see that. Um, and, that and steroid injections have been associated with some problems. I think in low dose, it's not a problem. But if you do high dose steroid injection or multiple injections, it can be a problem. And there's actually some evidence that it actually can exacerbate uh, diseases of the bone or of the cartilage. Surgery, of course, is uh, a final option for patients who have uh, failed conservative care. And I'm happy to report that um, many of our patients have been able to avoid surgery. There's a number of treatments that we've been doing now for more than 10 years, uh, and we're actually tracking data. We'll be publishing some data on the use of uh, treatments that have helped, helped people avoid surgery for four or five years, and in some cases, uh, much longer than that. So what are these new treatments? Well, we're going to talk about um, uh, stem cells. Dr. Ambach will be talking about that in a moment. But I'm going to uh, first talk to you about some other orthobiologics. So in 2004, Nancy Reagan was quoted as saying, science has presented us with a hope called stem cell research, which may provide our scientists with many answers that have for so long been beyond our grasp. So, you know, you first heard about embryonic stem cells, which we do not use currently, but there are other types of stem cells which have been shown to be effective for the treatment of osteoarthritis, as well as other medical conditions. Regenerative medicine is the concept that we can heal ourselves. And one of the ways we do this is through the use of cells and molecules that are produced by those cells. So we tell our patients now we are farmers. Farmers use seeds and soil and fertilizer to grow their crops. But we are living things just like plants. And so we are farmers of the human body. So in this case, we use cells, uh, stem cells or platelets, uh, scaffolds such as collagen and growth factors, which can be found in platelets to regenerate uh, tissue such as tendon or cartilage or bone. And this, this is collectively called orthobiologics. Orthobiologics are cells and molecules produced by those cells that have been shown to be helpful for orthopedic conditions. And these are some of the more common ones. Platelets, also called platelet-rich plasma, stem cells from different sources, such as bone marrow or fat tissue. Growth factors, which are proteins that are found in the blood, uh, as well as protease inhibitors. Proteases are molecules that degrade tissue. So by inhibiting that degradation, you can protect, protect and cause a regeneration of tissue. So these are about orthobiologics, and that's why our company is called San Diego Orthobiologics. So the first one, probably the most common one, this uh, was first used um, in the 1980s and became popular in orthopedics in the 1990s, uh, platelet-rich plasma, or PRP for short. And basically all it is is we take a, a sample of blood uh, through a simple blood draw and centrifuge the blood in our lab, which separates the blood into different layers. And so you see at the bottom there, the red blood cells compress into the lower layer, and we discard those. We don't use those cells. The cells that we use are the platelets, which is that middle white layer, and the plasma. And these contain growth factors, of which there are thousands of them, that have been shown to stimulate uh, healing. This is what these cells look like under the electron microscope. On the left, you see the red blood cell, which carries oxygen. The right, you see the white blood cell, which fights infection. And then the little purple platelet in the middle there, which helps with healing. And as I said, these platelets make the cell fertilizer. So they make these different proteins that cause cells to grow uh, and tissue to heal. They also can cause gross growth of new blood vessels. They can also decrease inflammation. And 
let me just see if I can bring us back to date here. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so does PRP heal osteoarthritis? Well, there's a number of studies that have been published in the scientific literature, hundreds and thousands of them now, uh, which do show efficacy. Matter of fact, there is so much evidence for PRP, for knee osteoarthritis, there's really no reason why insurance should not be covering this treatment. Unfortunately, at this time, like many of the other orthobiologic treatments that we offer, insurance does not cover it. Uh, for example, this is a meta-analysis where 14 randomized clinical trials uh, were analyzed over 1,400 patients showing that PRP is effective uh, more so than placebo hyaluronic acid gel, which a lot of patients get injected in their knees, uh, ozone therapy or steroid therapy. I'm sorry, Dr. Rogers, I just yes. need to interrupt. I think we're not seeing the slides that you are on right now. Okay, so let me see how I can take control. How about there that? There you go. That better? That's perfect. Yeah. So just again, this slide is a slide of, thank you. This slide is a slide uh, showing that PRP for neosarthritis has been well studied. There's actually more than 14 studies now that I think there's 17 studies. Randomized controlled trials. So one group gets a placebo and the other group gets PRP. And every one of those studies has shown that uh, PRP is more um, effective than the placebo or the other treatment. And um, this is typically more so for mild to moderate knee arthritis, but we've also seen benefit in more severe knee arthritis, including those patients who have bone on bone knee arthritis. And it doesn't seem to matter your age or your weight uh, or your gender. So the, the, um, the, the main issue is how severe is your arthritis. Um, and these studies uh, have also shown that these treatments are safe. Um, the main risk of any injection would be infection. And fortunately, we've not had any infections. Uh, and in these clinical studies, uh, they also show that the treatments are safe. We also use PRP for a variety of other conditions, such as tennis elbow or disc degeneration in the low back. And there are a number of studies that have been published. And uh, in future lectures, we'll go into more detail on some of these, some of these studies. So how do we make the PRP? Well, I told you we draw a little blood, just a simple blood harvest in the office by our phlebotomist, and then it's centrifuged in the lab uh, while you wait. Uh, and then once it's prepared, you see the separation between the blood and the platelets and the plasma. And then we just pull out that middle section, which has about 9 billion platelets, which is a lot of platelets, and they're all ready to produce growth factors there are different kinds of PRP depending on what we're treating. So if we treat joint arthritis, it might be different than if we're treating a tendon tear or a disc injury. But you see they come in different colors depending on how many red blood cells are in the mix. So on the left, you see the cranberry flavor, which has a lot of red cells and a lot of white cells. Whereas on the right, you have the pineapple flavor, which really doesn't have any red cells whatsoever. And those are more effective for joint. And I, the reason I show this is there are a number of studies that show that method and technique uh, matters. And so we have a lot of patients who have been to other clinics and their PRP treatment was not effective. And, and when we evaluate what was done, we realize that they had the wrong method performed. So it's really important that you find somebody who is an expert in this field. And uh, we have a little more detail. If you want to go to a YouTube channel and watch how some of these things are done, uh, Dr. Ambach has prepared these nice uh, YouTube videos. So you can go and take a look there. And then I'm going to let her talk about some of the other cells that we're use, using for osteoarthritis, such as stem cells. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. I'm gonna take control of the slides here. So stem cells have been a hot topic and it has generated a lot of interest due to its uh, many potential uses. So let's talk about these cells briefly. As you have learned in biology, your cells undergo cell division and they make copies of themselves. And this is to support development and growth. Stem cells are unique in that they not only make copy of themselves, they also differentiate into other cells. So there's two main types of stem cells. As Dr. Rogers have mentioned, there's the embryonic stem cells. And these are cells that are derived from embryo that develop from eggs and which are fertilized in the laboratory. These cells are used for research purposes only. We don't use this in clinical practice. The second type of cells are the adult stem cells. The adult stem cells are found in our tissues 
and they can generate different cell types for the specific tissue in which they live. In orthopedics, we are particularly interested in a kind of adult stem cell called mesenchymal stem cell or MSC. And that's because these MSCs have the potential to differentiate into bone, tendon, cartilage, and muscle cells. Dr. Arnold Kaplan is a professor of biology in, at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. And he's the father of MSC. He named and discovered MSCs about more than 25 years ago. So what, is the, what are these stem cells and how do they promote healing? So these MSCs are what we call mobile drug stores. And the reason being they contain hundreds of molecule, molecules that are involved in healing tissue, in controlling inflammation, and also in fighting infection. There's different sources of these cells in our body. We use cells that are derived from a patient's own bone marrow and fat or adipose tissue that are not processed by enzymes. These treatments are compliant with the current FDA regulatory guidelines. There are some cells that are derived from birth tissue products like amniotic tissue and umbilical cord blood, and these are not permitted by FDA at this time for orthopedic use. The safety and efficacy of these products have not been proven, and in fact, there's cases of bacterial infections that have been reported in patients who had received this birth tissue of blood injections. Researchers and um, scientists have tested these products and they did confirm that they do not contain live stem cells. So we have to be aware of clinics that advertise birth tissue products containing stem cells as they have not been proven in safety and efficacy. They do require a biologics license before they are allowed to be marketed to patients. So the, the therapies that are compliant with FDA guidelines are bone marrow, derived tissue, platelet-rich plasma, and adipose tissue. So is stem cell therapy safe? There are many research um, that have been published showing, showing the safety of these cell therapies. And these are some of those studies. There's no adverse events in about 2,000 patients that were treated with bone marrow-derived cell therapy in this first study. And in the second study, as you, have, as you can see, they found that there's no increased risk of cancer in almost 2,000 patients that were treated using bone marrow-derived cell therapy. This is a study that was done by Dr. Hernigau, who was from France, who published many important bone marrow stem cell studies. And the last study here showed no serious adverse events in more than 1,000 patients treated with fat-derived cell therapy. As Dr. Rogers have mentioned, our clinical experience reflects these findings. We have not seen any serious adverse events from these procedures. The most common adverse effect that our patients report is a slightly increased pain for a few days. And this is to be expected as this is the part of the healing process. So what is the evidence for cell-based therapies in osteoarthritis? A lot of you are probably familiar with PubMed, which is a, a database of scientific research and journals. Uh, so you can see there is an increasing trend of stem cell research, especially in the past 10 years, and more and more high quality research is being conducted. So these are some examples of this study. This particular study is um, using bone marrow derived cells for knee osteoarthritis. And they compared this with hyaluronic acid, which is a gel injection that has some anti-inflammatory and protective benefits. And they have found um, that there was about 56 patients enrolled in these studies. They have found a significant improvement in pain and function up to a year with this cell therapy injected knees compared to hyaluronic acid. This other study enrolled uh, almost 50 patients, about 48 patients, <clears throat> and they compared the bone marrow derived cells to exercise. And they have shown that there's significant improvement in activity, in movement, uh, stability, and pain for those patients that have been treated with this cell therapy compared to exercise. And also, they have shown that these improvements in their clinical outcomes continued through two years uh, throughout the length of their study. This is uh, three studies that have shown um, the benefits of adipose-derived uh, cells or fat-derived uh, cells for knee osteoarthritis. 
also showing improvement in uh, pain at rest and in function. And uh, one study actually showed an improved uh, cartilage content in half of the patients that were enrolled. So this is an arthroscopic picture of a knee joint. An arthroscopy is a surgical procedure where a small tube with a camera is inserted into the knee joint. And as you can see on the left, the white tissue is the cartilage. Um, it has been worn out and it shows the underlying bone underneath it. And one year after the injection of a fat-derived cell therapy, you can see more coverage of this bone tissue and more growth and improved quality of the cartilage covering the bone. These are studies uh, that have used a special MRI that uses a dye that detects uh, protein uh, in the cartilage tissues. And using this special um, imaging studies, they have shown some improvement in the quality of the cartilage before and after a bone marrow derived cell uh, therapy on the left and a fat derived uh, cell therapy on the right. So patients always ask us, you know, I have bone and bone arthritis. Will these therapies help me? And if you have a significant uh, degenerative joint disease and you've got bone and bone arthritis, this therapy is not likely to regrow lots of your cartilage. But there are lots of studies showing good results with these patients. And also, we have been successful in treating these patients when it comes to pain and function, even though there's no cartilage improvement. And this is because these cell therapies work in other ways. As you can see in this diagram here, it does provide benefit by killing cartilage destroying cells, regulating inflammation and increasing the blood flow to your joint, thus helping with tissue repair. Just like PRP, these uh, cell therapies are also used in other orthopedic conditions like tendon injuries, ligament injuries like ACL tears, bony injuries and degenerative discs in the low back. So is knee replacement surgery better than stem cell therapy? We get asked this a lot by our patients. And though surgery is sometimes the obvious solution for certain severe arthritis or severe cases, we've seen great results with stem cell therapy for osteoarthritis, where patients are able to avoid or even delay surgery. There's abundant data on safety and efficacy on the use of these therapies for knee osteoarthritis, that it makes it a great alternative to knee replacement. And as you know, surgery can have some complications like blood clots, infections, and complications from general anesthesia. So the decision should be made by both the patient and the doctor. And these are based on multiple factors, including the patient's condition, comorbidities, level of function, et cetera. This particular study actually wanted to answer this question and they enrolled 30 patients who have both knees that have severe osteoarthritis and one knee received bone marrow stem cell injection while the other knee uh, underwent knee replacement surgery. And after 12 years, they have shown that both knees did improve, but more patients preferred the stem cell injected knee. And uh, as we expected, there were more complications from the knee that underwent surgery. So John Hopkins University recently conducted a simulation-based analysis on elective orthopedic surgery cases due to COVID-19 restrictions. And their conclusion showed that it will take seven to 16 months, so about a year on the average, for the healthcare system to reach 90% of the expected pre-pandemic volume of orthopedic surgery that they had forecast. During these times when there are limited treatment options, likely even including delay of surgery cases, patients will need more than ever effective non-surgical treatments to treat their orthopedic problems. And cell-based therapies are an important alternative solution to fulfill these needs. I hope that after listening to this lecture, you, you get a pretty good sense and understanding of these therapies. These treatments can only be safely and effectively administered by physicians with the proper skills and training in regenerative medicine. So not all healthcare providers can provide this stem cell therapy. 
you want to seek board certified physicians who are specialized in diagnosing and treating orthopedic conditions. Typically, these specialties include, as Dr. Rogers mentioned, physical medicine, sports medicine, and orthopedics. You want to seek physicians who have advanced training in performing these procedures under imaging guidance, and also who have the skills in uh, knowing the best regenerative treatment for your specific condition and the experience in, in doing so. You want to see clinics who are compliant with FDA regulations and most importantly care about achieving the best results for their patients. So in an effort to provide the best care and help our patients make informed decisions, we use the regenerative medicine registry called Data Biologics. This is co-founded by Dr. Rogers and it's a cloud-based uh, registry that's globally used by different physicians. It's very easy to use, but through this we can track our outcomes and we can give our patients real data on our outcomes with these treatments. It's important to collect data not only to track outcomes, but also it's useful to guide future decisions made by insurance companies and regulators. So that concludes our lecture portion. If you missed anything, as they have mentioned, this webinar has been recorded and you can access this on different sites. And if you want more information or research articles and more videos, you can visit our other social media sites. So we're now open for the question and answer portion. Thank you, Dr. Ambach. that was great. Um, so we're starting to see some questions come in. So please just reminding everybody, if you have a question, which I hope you do, uh, if you look on that bar, if you just mouse over the screen, you'll see a bar pop up. And then the third from the right looks like a little window that a cartoon character might speak. And you just click on that and then you'll see the meeting chat and you can type in your message there. So our first question uh, is, do you use all three types of stem cells to treat patients? And I'm assuming you're referring to platelet-rich plasma, bone marrow-derived cells, and adipose cells. And so my first comment I'd like to make is, Although uh, we have stem cells all throughout our body, right? So if we harvest bone marrow tissue or if we harvest adipose tissue uh, through a simple liposuction procedure, there are very likely stem cells in those tissues. But I just want to be clear to everybody that this is not what I would call an isolated stem cell procedure. So an isolated stem cell procedure means you process that tissue further in a lab uh, and by the way, we do conduct research. We, we have a FDA approved clinical trial going on right now where, for example, your adipose tissue, your fat tissue, it goes to a lab, an FDA inspected lab. And uh, over the course of several weeks, cells are extracted and counted under a special type of cell counter. And then those patients do get cells, uh, stem cells injected. But typically when we're injecting bone marrow or adipose, tissue, there are going to be other cells in that. So it's better to call this a tissue transplant than a stem cell procedure. And I think that's a very important distinction because there are many physicians, and if you go uh, on their websites, you'll see they talk about stem cell therapy. Um, and I think it's important to, to note that distinction. Um, just to be clear, platelet-rich plasma is not a stem cell therapy. There are no stem cells in your blood typically. Although if you were to exercise and then we were to draw your blood, there might be a couple of stem cells floating around in there, but it's not gonna be a great number. And um, uh, so the answer to your question is we use all those orthobiologics. There are several others. If you go to our website, sdomg.com, you'll see where we talk about all these different procedures in much greater detail, uh, as well as some of the other orthobiologics that we use. So so the next question uh, says, what are the potential risks? So just like any injection, there's risks of bleeding, risk of pain at the injection site, um, allergy to the medications. Typically, we only use um, the local anesthesia or, or numbing medicine. Um, it's a pretty safe procedure. It's no more increased risks than your um, cortisone injection. In fact, it's, it's actually safer than uh, cortisone injection because you're using your own uh, cells and tissues. Um, the most common, as I uh, previously mentioned, that we uh, get from our patients is the, the increased discomfort for a few days. And as a part of the healing process, you once we inject these cells, your body undergo this inflammatory phase, which usually happens within the first three to five days. And you can feel some mild discomfort uh, in, in the knee. And that's typically the, the, the most common um, side effect that we get. 
there has been no studies that have shown that uh, platelet-rich plasma or bone marrow-derived cell therapy can cause uh, cancer or, or exacerbate cancer. Um, the same is true with uh, adipose-derived cell therapy. There has been um, conflicting studies, but most of the data suggests that uh, adipose-derived cell therapy and the other cell therapies are safe to use, uh, even in, in patients um, who has got medical comorbidities. So we are uh, very strict in um, uh, choosing our patients and uh, to make sure uh, that they, they're not on blood thinners, or if they are, we, we have to stop the blood thinners. Uh, there are some medications that can affect the therapy, and we can get into that later, um, which we need to stop as well. But uh, as I said, there's lots of studies that have shown safety data on these therapies, um, and we had not have any problems aside from uh, the ones that are mentioned. We do, and as Dr. Ambach mentioned, we do track our adverse events uh, as if we were in an FDA-approved clinical trial for all our patients using that data biologics registry. And so far, uh, that's allowed us to track hundreds of patients. And typically, the only response we see is, like Dr. Ambach said, patients will have some pain or soreness, which is usually managed with Tylenol or ice for a couple of days. Um, I, I would just add the other risk that patients take is, you know, these procedures are not covered by insurance. So there is a financial risk. And many patients who come to us have already tried many other things, have spent thousands of dollars on other treatments, perhaps have had surgery uh, for their condition and still have pain. So we're not taking, you know, easy cases. These are challenging cases. So there, uh, and this is new evolving technology. So there's, you know, we're always pushing the envelope on what this technology can offer, but we're not foolhardy. We're using the published scientific evidence. We're using, you know, our 10 plus years of experience to guide our decision making. So we're always, we always have a healthy expectation of, of, of what to expect from a given treatment, but there is the risk, of course, with any medical procedure that you may that we may not get the outcome that we desire. So I think that's really probably the greatest risk, I think, of, of these things uh, is, is that. Um, the next question is, um, it says, my arthritis is limited to my hands. How can this treatment be used? So um, as you know, you have lots of joints in your hands. The most common joint in the body, by the way, to get osteoarthritis is this one here, right at the base of the thumb. It's, uh, it's, it's a treatment, uh, it's a condition that we see very often in the clinic where the cartilage will thin, the joint will become swollen, uh, in some cases, it can become quite severe. It's obviously debilitating because we use our hands all the time. And depending on the severity of the condition, uh, we can treat that with PRP. Uh, and in some cases, we have to go to something that's going to be a little more potent. If it's a more severe condition, we might have to go to using cells from bone marrow or from adipose tissue. But we do have some data on that. Um, there's also been some published papers. Uh, for the smaller joints, the little tiny ones in the finger, which are very commonly involved with osteoarthritis. People probably have little bumps on the joints that you're familiar with. Uh, those are called Haberdin's nodules, named after a doctor with an ego. Uh, everything in medicine, <laughs> everything in medicine is named after a doctor with an ego. Everything has a name associated. So Haberdin's nodules, very common to see these uh, bone spurs on the joints. As long as the joint is not too severely degenerated, we typically get good results. Um, so that's we would evaluate that on a case by case basis. So next question um, asks, are there medication that kills the stem cells? So there are medications that can affect um, the therapy. For example, um, anti-inflammatories um, and certain types of blood thinners can affect uh, platelet function and maybe your cell function. So those are things that we want our patients to stop um, usually about a week or so before and after the procedure. Um, Patients who are who have uh, systemic inflammatory conditions, who are on uh, anti-inflammatories, usually we just uh, we we let them continue their medications because what we don't want is we don't want you to flare up uh, and make your uh, base base condition worse. Uh, so we we have to weigh the risks and the benefits of each uh, medication. Um, are there other medications that you can think of, Dr. Rogers? Well, I was going to say on the flip side, is there something you can do to boost the uh, number or quality of the stem cells in your body? And there's really good evidence that exercise, big surprise there, right? Exercise actually promotes stem cell health as well as every cell in your body naturally. But also there's some new evidence that uh, intermittent fasting or sometimes a prolonged fast 
can improve the number of uh, stem cells. Um, there's more work needs to be done in this area to see if that's a temporary effect or if that's a sustained effect. But that's uh, something that has played out in the literature. Um, and uh, of course, um, you know, there are things that people, there are habits that people have, drinking too much, smoking too much. Um, these things are also toxic to cells. Uh, and um, so, you know, it just makes sense that uh, all these things that doctors have been telling their patients for the last several decades uh, would also apply to stem cell. Next is, um, I have seronegative mild uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Can this be helpful? So there are actually um, a number of studies, oh, and then you go on to ask about hip bursitis. So there are a number of studies that have looked at uh, use of cells for patients with rheumatoid arthritis. There's a really nice study where cells from the fat were used to treat patients with, uh, with rheumatoid arthritis, um, mostly affecting the knee and the hip. Um, and have shown safety and efficacy. So yes, there is some data there. There's a couple of studies on PRP for rheumatoid arthritis. You know, rheumatoid arthritis is gonna be a, a slightly different disease than osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is an inflammatory disease. It's a chronic inflammatory disease. There, it, it is a cartilage disease. Um, it's not just a simple wearing down. We used to tell our patients, it's just like your brake shoes on your car, you know, or your tires, they just wear down. But it's actually more complicated than that. It's the trauma to the tissue, but it's also this ongoing low-grade inflammation, uh, which is why probably healthy diet and healthy exercise and not having a lot of inflammation in your body is helpful also. Rheumatoid arthritis is different. It has this immune component. So the immune system has decided that your cartilage uh, and more specifically your, the, the lining of the joint, the synovial tissue is the enemy. And so like a lot of other autoimmune conditions, you have this tissue damage because the immune system is out of control. Um, and I think in the future, uh, we'll also be looking at ways to modify the immune system using stem cells, uh, probably through intravenous infusion. But uh, this is not ready for prime time yet. This is just being done in the clinical studies at this time. But yes, we have treated patients. I just recently treated a patient with uh, lupus, which is another autoimmune disease who had very severe hip osteoarthritis. And she has done very well with uh, bone marrow uh, derived cell therapy. So this next question is related, and Dr. Rogers can answer this question. Is, does it also help heal damaged joints by rheumatoid arthritis? Um, so the, as Dr. Rogers mentioned, it does help with the inflammation. Uh, it does help protect your cartilage, but it is a systemic problem. It can affect um, outcomes, but we had some pretty good success on these patients as well. So uh, the next question says, what follow-up treatment will be needed and for how long? So the most of these cells uh, these therapies are one time injection patients do really well with one injection um typically we ask them to take it easy within the first few days and then they can start resuming uh, light exercise by the second week and progress as tolerated um so there's really not a lot of downtime uh, if you, you you call it that uh, just the few, first few days of uh, rest and light activities and then with regards to follow up we usually want to uh, see our patients within six to eight weeks just to see their progress um, and, and their healing and to make sure they, they don't have any uh, side effects. We call our patients within the first few days after the procedure to make sure that uh, everything uh, went well. Um, but with regards to, again, for follow-up, we usually see them either at three months and then follow up at another six months and, and uh, quicker than that if needed. And we actually tell our patients, you're stuck with us for at least a year because we're going to follow your outcomes to a year. A lot of really good clinical studies do that. They will follow their patients for a year because that's um, meaningful. And it's interesting. We see continued benefit beyond that first three-month period. So most of our patients will see benefit within the first three months, uh, depending on the condition and the treatment. But that's a pretty good general window. Uh, but if you continue to track patients' results beyond that three-month period, you'll see that there's continuous sustained benefit, particularly if they start becoming more active, um, have a more consistent stretching and strengthening program. I've had a number of patients who have severe joint arthritis and cannot exercise, uh, and as a result, gained a lot of weight. I've had, I, I've had one patient, he lost 60 pounds within the year after I treated him. Um, and uh, because he no longer had pain, and so he was able to exercise more. Um, and so obviously we encourage, we encourage at least six weeks of focused physical therapy training because 
you know, many patients are deconditioned when they've been in pain. You know, you, you, you figure out that if you're not as active, it doesn't hurt as much. So, but, but then you get deconditioned, your muscles get weaker, your cardiovascular function declines. So uh, once the pain is improved, then that allows you to engage in exercise and strengthening and stretching without having pain. And so your function can improve uh, and your fitness can improve. And that process could take, you know, up to six months. Uh, but, you know, we like to see, you know, patients do that. The patients who do that uh, tend to have better outcomes than those who do not. Um, looks like we have some more questions here. Uh, by the way, the question was, are there any insurance carriers that cover these therapies? By the way, my comment to that patient who lost 60 pounds, uh, by the way, he was able to get off his insulin and get off his high blood pressure uh, medication, his antihypertensives. Uh, and my comment to him was, your insurance company definitely should have paid for this treatment because you just saved them a whole lot of money because now you're a lot healthier and you're not going to need as much medical care. Um, and I think it's just a matter of time before insurance companies get it. Um, some have. Uh, TRICARE, for example, has begun to cover some of these procedures. Um, there are a number of companies who are self-indemnified, so they they uh, you know pay for their employees' health insurance, and they have begun to embrace these therapies uh, and have covered these therapies and have realized uh, the cost savings as a result. You can imagine, you know, if someone is able to avoid knee replacement surgery, uh, how much money that would save the insurance company. So uh, it takes a time, uh, and I've been saying this for 10 years, but it takes time for the insurance, insurance company to get it. But I think uh, as the data continues to be collected and, and as these benefits continue to be realized, I think eventually uh, they will be covered. Um, the next question is, how many PRP injections do you give for knee arthritis? Um, Dr. Ambach, do you want to re review some of, some of that? Of course. Um, so also to add, Dr. Rogers, I think there are some um, work comp um, insurances right. that cover uh, these therapies as well. Um, so how many PRP injections for knee arthritis? In, in our experience, when you have uh, the, the milder forms of arthritis, one injection typically uh, is enough to control uh, pain and, and symptoms and uh, increase the function that can last for several years. There are uh, patients who may need um, uh, one or two more injections um, for uh, their arthritis, but most of the time, uh, one injection will do it. There has been um, not enough uh, data to, to tell us for sure, okay, for this specific condition, you're going to need this specific number of treatments. Uh, there's some data that say that maybe a, a series of injections would would uh, do better, but there's also some data that say that only one injection is enough. So it's really um, very uh, patient specific, and we just uh, monitor the patients and see how they do and and uh, um, decide on the additional injections if they need to. Yeah, the vast majority of our patients, probably more than ninety percent, only get one treatment. And I think the reason for that is we spend a lot of time evaluating the situation and. We're not guessing when we go, when we decide that someone is a candidate and we're gonna move forward, uh, we've already ticked all the boxes. So for example, I, I have, I've heard of physicians doing PRP for patients who have severe deformity of the knee. You know, the, the angulation is bad or the knee is unstable. They have severe ligament injuries or they have severe meniscus injuries. We know that in those patients, the success rate is gonna be low. So we. We're very selective in who we treat, um, and uh, we want to make sure you have a high probability of having a good outcome. So that that discussion is is very important. Um, the last question is why aren't these treatments more widely used? And the answer is they are becoming more widely used. I think the first conference I ever attended more than ten years ago, I think there were maybe twenty doctors in the audience. The last conference that I lectured at, there were over eight hundred doctors. Many of them were orthopedic surgeons. So now orthopedic surgeons are beginning to embrace this technology. I think they realize that the science is, is sound. The clinical evidence is very good, um, you know, with thousands of clinical studies now being conducted. Um, there's some really uh, creative use. Uh, I saw a great lecture about a doctor in uh, Georgia who's performing anterior cruciate ligament repair. Uh, which we know uh, is a difficult surgery. Uh, they're augmenting that surgery by adding bone marrow stem cell, uh, bone marrow cells, 
at the time of surgery, they're showing that those patients heal more quickly. They're showing that the ligament is stronger, the knee is stronger. So um, cell therapy in many cases can replace surgery. So patients can avoid having surgery, but there are cases where surgery is necessary and cell therapy has been shown to improve the outcomes and speed up healing. So there's a lot of creative orthopedic surgeons now doing some really interesting work, meniscus repairs, other things using cells at the time of surgery or as a staged procedure where the, where the cell therapy is performed after. Um, and uh, I think we're just gonna continue to see this to grow and grow uh, as more and more doctors make the effort to learn about it. Uh, you know, none of us learned this in medical school. You know, I graduated medical school more than 20 years ago. So we had to learn this on our free time. So uh, I think that's another barrier uh, for a lot of physicians if they don't make the effort. Um, there's a lot to learn here. So, um, so but it's, it's definitely evolving and uh, we're seeing more uh, widespread acceptance. So there's another um, what question here, last question here. If a patient has a meniscus tear along with osteoarthritis in the knee, would this therapy not be appropriate? So unfortunately, when you do have um, arthritis in your knee, almost always you also have meniscus degeneration because your cartilage and your meniscus, which is the cushion, shares the load uh, in your joint. So uh, almost always this goes together. And at the same time, if patients have a meniscus tear, they are also more at risk for developing osteoarthritis. So we have treated you know, a lot of patients who does have both. And in fact, uh, there has been studies that had shown an improvement of the meniscus tissue with uh, this cell therapies. So this would not contraindicate um, you getting these treatments. There are um, certain types of meniscus tear, like a bucket handle tear, and which causes instability in your knee that might need surgical intervention. But most cases of degenerative meniscus tear can be treated with cell therapy with good outcomes. And I'll just add, there are a number of studies that show that if you just take 100 people off the street over the age of 50 and do an MRI, even though they've never had knee pain in their life, you're going to see some degeneration of the meniscus. So a lot of times the meniscus is not even the source of the pain. So as Dr. Ambach said, if it's a degenerative meniscus, a lot of times those patients will do very well with just a simple injection of cell therapy but the more complicated ones where the, the meniscus is deranged or perhaps the knee is getting stuck, can't straighten or bend the knee because the meniscus is actually flopping around in there. That's, that's a whole different ball game. Um, I'll just add a lot of patients end up getting meniscus surgery uh, because their MRI showed a meniscus tear. And there's more and more evidence showing that patients who have degenerative meniscus and knee arthritis on their MRI generally don't do any better than conservative care. And there's been a number of randomized clinical trials that show if that patient is treated surgically, they don't necessarily do any better than if they just had six weeks of physical therapy. So we think there's a lot of unnecessary knee arthroscopy surgery being performed. And we think a lot of those patients could be served by just a simple injection instead. And the other thing I'll add is that um, we've seen a number of patients who maybe did well with a meniscus uh, arthroscopy surgery, but then two or three years later, their knee pain comes back because they still have the osteoarthritis and we've had very good results in treating uh, those patients. Um, any other questions to see? I yeah. think that's the last question. Yeah, great. Well, um, if you have other questions or if your friends or family have questions after you talk with them about this uh, webinar, uh, feel free to contact us. You see the information there. We'll send you a copy of our information so you have it as a reference. We're really excited about this new field. Obviously, we've dedicated our professional lives to studying it, and uh, we're, we appreciate your interest in what we do, and, and we'll look forward to helping you if we can. Thank you for your time.